Hello, everyone. Blair's doing her little Enya dance. I don't know what's happening there. Yeah, we are here to talk about science, not to do performance art, not to... <laughs> it's the both. same thing, man. It's the same, not to do interpretive dance, although we can do that if you'd yeah. like. I mean, yeah. there's a whole dance your PhD thing out there in the wild. So There's two whole intro just, and outros for us to go through. There's so be many. So much dancing to be had. I hope so. I hope we dance through this show. It's a science dance. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a podcast. That's what we do here <laughs> this, this week in science. Oh. And if you have not done uh, the subscribing before, if you're just finding us on Twitch or YouTube or Facebook, please click the sub subscribe button. Give us a like. Sign up for notifications so that all of these videos of ours that we do live, um, you'll find out about them when they get started. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we do this live and then it's recorded and edited and things are shortened for uh, brevity if they need to be and for clarity. And uh, we get rid of technical difficulties and all that kind of stuff. So this is where if you're here watching it on the, the videos. Raw feed. Raw feed, this is where all the bloopers are. So you're in for the good times. But we're going to do a quick 90, a tight 90. We're going to make it happen today. Uh, so without further ado, it's time for us to start this show. You ready? Let's do it. We are starting in. Hold on, I got to move things over. I moved things over again. Why do I do that? We are starting in a three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 885, recorded on Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. How do AIs see the universe? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with AI, dead spiders, and shouting embryos. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Science is doing it. Whether it's scanning the sky in search of ancient galaxies and finding them, or seeking cures for cancers and HIV and creating them, science is doing exactly what scientists imagine it one day would. When setting goals for exploration and discovery, science takes on the most difficult tasks and delivers again and again and again. Without science, we are but dreamers, poets in an impossible world, philosophers with a pocket full of insightful concepts, wishfully thinking, hopefully praying, blindly wandering from feckless thought to circumstances fraught with unexplainable outcomes cobbling together incongruent ideas in place of rational understanding. But with science, we pull reality into focus, separate fact from fiction, bias from observation, and with clear-eyed purpose, get things done. And while the wishful cobblers of incoherent explanations still wander fraughtly boasting with blurry bluster, you have stumbled upon a place where dreams become reality. With This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again doing our weekly walk through the world of scientific wonders. Ah, and it's been a hot week. It's hot, hot, hot all mm. over the place, all over the place. Hot in the science world as well. I have stories this week about zip codes for RNA, AI understandings, and death 
by lactose. Ah. What do you have, Justin? Oh, I just lost. I've got uh, HIV cures. Uh, again, uh, just good news about wildfires. Really? NASA's new plan for Mars. And a bit of a rant about the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> oh, Appropriate. Always a good time for a bit of a rant. Yes related to that topic. Blair, what is in yes. the Animal Corner? Well, tonight we have a very special edition of Blair's Animal Corner. I'm calling it Blair's Fetus Corner. Okay. It's uh, a couple stories about fetuses. And then before that, we're going to talk about dead spiders and wildlife photography. And they're separate stories. It's not one thing. It's not people taking pictures of dead spiders, although I'm sure. Oh, I like that happens. idea, though. Oh, that that yeah. could be a thing. Oh, sure. Oh, there's one. Ah, oh, shoot. It's still alive. All right. Anyway. I can't. I can't take a picture of this spider. No. It's still living. Find a dead oh. one. Uh, way yeah. I can get close enough. Well, before we get to those mental pictures of dead spiders, <laughs> uh, I want to remind you that subscribing to Twists wherever it's found is easy to do. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform. You can find us on YouTube, on Facebook, and Twitch, where we stream live weekly, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. You can find us on KDBS 90.3 FM in Davis. I think that's Mondays from 8 to 9 in the morning. And uh, you can also find us as Twist Science on Instagram, on Twitch, and on Twitter. Basically, look for This Week in Science just about everywhere you'll find us. Oh, yeah. If this is too much information, go to twist.org. That's our website, and that's where you can find all sorts of other great information about the show. But now it's time for the science. Yes. Okay. Have you ever wondered if when we are, you know, talking about physics or when you're in your physics class in college or even in high school, is this the only way that physics works? Do we really know that physics, the way we calculate it, the way that we look at it, the E equals MC squared, that the principles that led, that led to the law of re relativity, that, they, that if there are aliens with a different mathematical system or with a different way of looking at the universe, maybe they've come up with different physics. So yes. Have you ever thought about that? I yes. I have, I have a long answer, but I'll give short you the answer, short one. Please. Yeah. I'll give you the short one. Uh, the, the math could be different, but I, if the results are different, that would be surprising. It's, the thing that that always stuck with me was there there were certain questions in physics that always were just like we're gonna pretend it's like this and that's close enough and that always kind of got me but especially the like light is a particle and a wave and sometimes it's one and sometimes it's both and sometimes it's you know I was like mm, we're missing something <laughs> there's something that we're not looking at here. Yeah, we still, we still, you know, are kind of like, what is gravity, right? Yeah. It's, yep. Is it a force? Is it a particle? Like, there's, you know, what makes the force? You, we yeah. still don't have answers for these things. Not that we can have to be expected to have all the answers all the time right now. Uh, well, anyway, some researchers thinking about these questions and actually trying to think about, well, what if an alien were looking at the at the universe, how would they have come upon the various parameters that we use to define things? So in all of the aspects of physics, uh, all the laws of thermodynamics, everything that we've come to codify as scientific laws, they are all based on measurable parameters. You know, we have, um, you can measure a, a square, a, a, a uh, you know, any kind of object, you can measure it by its height, its width, its length. We have forces like acceleration, velocity. We have all sorts of all sorts of things that go together, but are they the right things always? So what they did is they used um, artificial intelligence that was basically given videos of different scenarios of fire in a fireplace of um, very simple things like, or well, not simple things, but springs bouncing up and down. You know, lots of videos of which 
the AI could make observations. And from those observations, come up with parameters and then explanate physics explanations. Hmm. Interesting. And the AI came up with alternative physics. Mm -hmm. It came up with different numbers of parameters to explain huh. things that we've come to explain. And they, and they seem to have a certain amount of standardization. Um, but I mean, this is by no means, yeah, like, oh yeah, AI sees the world differently. Well, it does see the world differently, but we don't know, we, you know, we haven't right. falsified and made sure that all of their conclusions are really, really, really right. And the, and the, the physicists, the roboticists who were involved in this, they've, they're, they're actually scratching their heads and going, what are we missing? What did AI see that we haven't seen? Well, that's or the first thing the AI... I thought of too, is, is constants. Yeah. A lot of constants are just like, what number can I use that makes all of this make sense? Right. Yep. But but mm -hmm. part of the reason for the constants and those the infills that later you often are, get solved with the mechanism and everything else is, mm -hmm. is that we have observations. We start everything from observations and we have many, many thousands of years of observations. Uh, the first thing I thought of when you were pointing this out was some uh, uh, ancient or old uh, uh, models of the solar system where Mars would be heading one direction, then it would turn around and go the other way. Uh, right. Because it was what can explain that? Yeah. The idea that the Earth was the center of our solar system. And what's uh, incredible is those models worked. They were predictive. Right. Uh, They're with predictive with a they certain amount tell. of error. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> but they could, but they could, they could say, well, Mars is heading this direction. It's going to turn around and go the other way uh, next month. Right? And, and it would. Oh, okay. So we've got the right answer. Well, it wasn't the right answer. It was just a predictive model that had, was completely flawed uh, in in how it was conceiving these things interacting, but as a model in terms of predictive ability still functioned okay. Right. Well, this question, the, the question that these researchers are asking in their paper that was published in Nature, where did I, where did that go? Oh, well, that was way down there. Nature Computational Science this week, in case you're interested in checking it out. Uh, you know, they're interested in the predictive aspects of artificial intelligence. How can artificial intelligence help make all of our predictions better? How can it, how can AI help us do better science? How can AI help us understand the universe more accurately? So they have been validating these systems with their AI models that have been, you know, taught by video. So just observation, right? And uh, they, they determined they were able to validate the variables that were being used. They were able to validate the answers, but because there's more variables, basically the, the, these roboticists have come to the conclusion that we just don't, they don't understand the mathematics that their AI is using, but that their AI is using uh, mathematics that's slightly different. So this does suggest that maybe aliens have come up with different laws of physics that have different explanations. It does suggest that maybe there is something more to our universe that we aren't noticing, that we haven't accounted for. As brilliant as Newton and uh, Einstein and all the others have been, you know, it's once you start at a certain mathematical assumption and move forward, you're going to be using that same system. And maybe we're blinded by the system that we're using. Um, and maybe we just don't have the right set of variables for a lot of things because we haven't defined them all because of our human interpretation of phenomena. Anyway, different ways to look at the universe. Very interesting. Yes. They're going to yeah, be looking but... that, you know, they have a lot of things to, to continue this line of research on, but it's very interesting. So uh, what more can the AI teach us about physics? All right, Justin. Quick, just a quick note on that too. The the decimal system, and instead of a, mm -hmm. a, a system of tens, if we had a, a numeral numerical system of twelves, where the 
the units that built up things. Uh, a, a third would be a finite number. It's a weird thing that we have a third is a 3.33 infinite number. A third of something right. is not infinite, but that's, you know, it's- It is a discrete quirks. amount, yeah. It's, a, it's it, uh, if it were a decimal system, you would be, you know, you'd have to make up a couple digits, fit them in there. It would still look like 10 at the end, but there'd be 12 units. Hard to explain, don't want to get into it. But you would have like four would be a third of something. Mm -hmm. And it would just be fine. Like nobody would have, it would be just like, oh, there's nothing weird about that. But I, I remember having this awful time trying to conceive of why is a third of something infinite uh, yeah. and, and, and any number as a kid? It just, that bothered me. Because anyway. our system isn't as accurate as maybe it could be. So yeah, this is, I think I find it fascinating and it really gets at that idea of AI having not a human mind, right? That we aren't recreating recreating human intelligence, especially for these kinds of situations that are very kind of specific. Um, that you know, the AI is a model that is going to create itself. Tell me about HIV, Justin. Well, I don't really have much to say about HIV, other than research has announced this week that a fourth person has been completely cured of HIV. And this is making it the second person this year alone. This is uh, this is the quote from the 66 year old man who received the treatment. I am beyond grateful. When I was diagnosed with HIV in 1988, like many others, I thought it was a death sentence. I never thought I would live long, uh, would live to see the day that I no longer have HIV. Uh, and he, this individual was somebody who went on uh, one of the trial drugs early on that uh, ended up uh, allowing him to live this long. One that hmm. you know most people who have HIV are now on these anti, I think they're antiviral medications. Uh, so he was, but this came about not because he had HIV. He was diagnosed with leukemia in 2019 and was going to be receiving a bone marrow transplant. So they populated the bone marrow with stem cells from an unrelated donor with a rare mutation in which part of the CCR5 gene is missing, which makes people resistant to HIV. Hmm. Bone marrow, of course, is where your blood is made. So it made more of that resistant blood and complete cure. High risk though, uh, of requiring a bone marrow transplant along with specific stem cell donation required uh, makes the procedure a poor fit for the tens of millions of patients currently diagnosed with HIV. However, researchers are looking for ways to mimic the results of this extreme procedure without, of course, all of the risks. One of the things that was mentioned around this story was that in a bone marrow transplant, you essentially wipe out the immune system completely first. Yeah. And it might not work. And it's something that you would not undertake if somebody has a, you know, a certain level of health and well-being and prospective future days ahead of them. But in this case, a patient has cancer, greater risk of dying in a short period of time uh, than uh, so Go for it, right? So but this now is, the search is on for less invasive form of gene therapy for the remaining 30 million people living with HIV. Yeah, I would wonder if uh, something like CAR-T, where um, they take blood cells out of the body and use CRISPR or some other uh, gene modification they actually use therapy HIV in that. To, yeah, yeah. to modify the blood cells and then put them back in, right? And it's 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 interesting because in that in the CAR T they use a they actually use the ability of HIV to hide from yeah. the body, uh, to uh, to train up and uh, to train up the, the 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 T cells that they're that they're hybridizing and putting back in. So I don't know. I actually don't know if CAR that CAR T therapy would work. It would on work with specifically, HIV but yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but doing something uh, but similar are, yeah, to the leukemia at, uh, bone, bone marrow tra transplant, you know, but you can have 
maybe just blood cells or you know something, yeah. something well, some idea, other some other one way. One of the ideas I mean, that yeah. got floated as science fiction in this. They they yeah. said this is science fiction, but a but the idea would be to get to a point where somebody could get a shot with a CRISPR enzyme that could go through and modify uh, the the bone marrow. Uh, to produce this, what is uh, an altered, m mutated gene that makes people immune to it. That one's it's still science fiction, but they're 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 looking at all of the possibilities, and they they know now that this gene, uh, di this one gene difference, is enough to prevent somebody from having HIV. Go That's into insane. remission if you've already got it. Now yeah. they just have to figure out a way to get the cure to the source, the place where it needs to be integrate that gene into an already living person. Amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're curing HIV IV, and hopefully we will get many more people than four. Um, and there will be many, many more in the future. But let's move on from the living to the land of the dead. Blair? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I hope you're all ready for this. Um, this is a study out of Rice University. Um, this was all uh, a hydraulics lab that found a dead spider on the floor. They were moving stuff around. It was curled up the edge of the hallway, and they were curious why spiders curl up after they die. And mm -hmm. as uh, those that are familiar with the anatomy of spiders will tell you, they have hydraulic muscles, essentially. They only have flexor muscles, which means um, that the hydraulics extend them outward. Uh, there's hydraulic pressure that does that. And so when they die, if they're not pushing out, the only thing that those legs are going to default into is curling in. So that's why they curl up when they die. So true roboticists said, we want to find a way to leverage that mechanism. So you guessed it. They figured out how to use spiders, dead spiders, as essentially a claw machine. So. <laughs> All right. Please describe. What, yes, yes, yes. How does this work? <laughs> so they repurposed deceased spiders as mechanical grippers. And so the, the two benefits there, it's, uh, it's natural, it's biodegradable, and it camouflages because it's a spider. Um, so they have deemed this necrobotics is a new field of study that you should all keep an, an ear and an eye out for. Um, this is a lab that, that specializes in soft robotic, robotic systems. They use plastics, metals, electronics. They use hydrogels, and elastomers. They use chemical reactions, pneumatics, and light. They're even currently working on textiles and wearables. So they're trying to find ways to make robotics uh, softer, more dynamic. And so what a better thing to use than a dead spider, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so so th what they did is um, they found that there are internal valves in the spider's hydraulic chamber or prosoma, which allows them to control each leg individually. So in the future, they're hoping they're going to be able to do that. But instead, um, all of those valves are open after they die. And so they were able to tap into that chamber with a needle. They attached it with a dab of super glue also to prevent any leaking of air. And then they had a syringe connected to the needle where they just put in a teeny tiny amount of air and that opened up the legs like a claw machine. They ran one deceased spider through a thousand open closed cycles to see how well their limbs would hold up and they ended up doing pretty well at about a thousand uses they started to uh break down and so they think that has to do with dehydration in some way in the joints and they think that they can actually overcome that thank goodness by applying polymeric coatings so um they think that they can really use spiders to do important manipulations. Um, this is pick and place tasks is what they call them. Repetitive tasks like sorting or moving objects on very small scales, like assembly of microelectronics. So they think, yes, Justin, yep, picking up a sponge there. So uh, it, it really just looks like a claw machine. There's really no other way to describe it, except it is a dead spider. <laughs> 
doing it. And they're able to pick up these little pieces of sponge, move them from point A to point B. And so they think that because they could camouflage, they could use this to capture smaller insects in nature. They can biodegrade them after they have used up their kind of uses and uh, that they can do um, soft manipulations like turning a light on or off on a switchboard. So it's, you know, it's a thing that I guess we can do with science. We have figured this out. The real ladies and is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, present to you tonight a lecture on necrobotics from the esteemed professor of necrobotics, Doctor Frankenstein. Yes, I, I think, I think my, please. my my favorite is uh, spiders picking up spiders. Yes, a, so a we dead can spider. use dead spiders to clean yes. up spiders. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know a dead you know what spider I love about this being story? used to pick up another dead spider. You're correct. You know what I love about about this story. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. any spider watching this uh, video? Is like, oh gosh, humans are horrific. <laughs> yeah, They're terrifying. Hey, after this story, I got to say, I agree. <laughs> <You're more scared laughs> of rough. us. Yeah. So um, the, the thing that they were very interested in with these wolf spiders that they were using is that they can lift more than 130% of their own body weight. And they have found that based on the size of the wolf spiders, uh, the smaller they are, the greater percentage of body weight they could carry. The larger they were, closer to just 100% of their body weight that they could carry. So they want to do oh. further research, I'm so sorry, spiders, uh, on smaller species so that they can test the limits of their ability to pick up things larger than themselves. So oh, insects, you're in trouble now. Necrobotics, it's the it's, hottest yes. field. Yeah. It's, can we just take, can we have the normal science story where at the end of this, I go, so with this information, we can make biodegradable microscopic claws with the same hydraulic mechanism. Why do we have to use dead spiders? Why? Yeah. Yeah. So, use the same mechanism, make yeah. little tiny biodegradable bots. Yes. yes, right. But yeah. because also, let with, me just tell you. You start with an observation in nature. You figure yes. out how nature did it. You see, right. is that the optimal? Chances are it's pretty close. And then you improve it from there. And then the next thing you know, you're using that claw based on that research to pick up core samples from Mars and, and tiny that helicopters great. that you're putting onto rockets and sending back to Earth. That's not how this research was presented. I will no, say, but, but, but also is. here's the, here's it's the other usually... problem. No, it, it usually is. They usually say, no. and here's what we're going to do with it. No, but, they were like, we're going to use the dead spiders. Yeah, because yeah. this is the other yeah. problem. <laughs> this is the thing that like, it's very easy to look right past. You can't use a long dead spider for a bunch of reasons. One being if they died of natural causes, they might not have all their legs. Another being if they dry out, the hydraulics won't work. So you need like a freshly dead spider, which how do you get those? You have a spider farm. Yeah. And then you, I don't know. Yeah. Do you sacrifice the spiders yes. for science? Yes. I do believe in this case, they, they froze them to euthanize I, them. I think you're overlooking so. the uh, constant need of spider prosthetics in the <laughs> spider pet community. <laughs> Right. Uh, and ignoring the entire segment of. Uh, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So this is one of those. Just because you could, doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you should. You should. I think exactly. Should. I think they're doing good science there. It's it's Sounds very like interesting. I just don't think spider claws are the solution. I think that spider this claw. is spider claw. It's a very interesting yeah. test of, as you said, Justin, like natural design like m millions of years yeah. of of evolution and that that is going to end in a very efficient and effective mechanism but as generally speaking dead spiders to assemble electron i'm not i'm not interested. again you start you. with you start right. with understanding how the how how to manipulate yes. the dead spider and then you create the 
non-organic version of it for your actual use like, or organic but synthetic organic yes but uh, that is which, so they, they were focused yep. on necrobotics which is necrobotics. the point of this story and that is not that uh, um moving on from spiders let's talk about uh how things move around inside our cells we know that there's a uh, a uh, uh, a skeleton in our cytoplasm. There are little fibrils, tendrils that that motor proteins act in, myosin move along and they move things around. So you can have big proteins that get moved around, but little bits of stuff, RNA that gets produced from the tra uh, translation of DNA in the transcription of proteins. How does that, those little bits, how do those little bits of RNA know where to go? Some of them have to stay in the nucleus. Others have to leave the nucleus to find a ribosome to be assembled into a protein. How do they figure out where to go? Well, oh, some... Uh, glycolization? Not glycolization. Gly yeah, but something very similar. There is... Uh, as published in the study in Nature Communications this week, researchers have determined that there are little tiny bits of code in RNA that is like a zip code. Hmm. And these little tiny bits of code get read by little postal carriers. And the postal carriers say, you go here, you go there. And the postal carriers within the nucleus of the cell are responsible for this. So they first, these researchers determined that there were these little bits of code, these zip codes, that basically, <clears throat> if there was a certain zip code, all those same RNAs with that zip code went to a certain place. Different zip codes went to different places, and that's how they the sorting how the researchers saw the sorting. Um, they were able to determine that there was this this process going on and so then they're like okay how does this really happen and you know there's little short segments straight segments of rna there's also circular rna and they're like is there any difference between these things and they did find that with this linear and circular rnas in the postal system they these postal clerks specialized in the different forms of rna so there's one postal clerk that likes the circulars and says, I'm going to send the circulars to where they need to go. And the other postal clerk so only, only deals with the linear. So there is a categorization based on package shape. versus letter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so they were able to determine that um, by blocking some of the activity of these postal clerks uh, and blocking the ability of the clerks to read the zip codes, uh, that the RNA totally got mixed up and didn't know where it was supposed to be. And so by they, they broke the postal system in order to figure out how it worked. That's incredible. So yeah. my first reaction, of course, is, ah, anthropomorphizing a cellular. <laughs> and it, but then, you know, when you think yeah, about it, the way any city operates and functions is so much just an uh, an upscaled version of what takes place in a cell anyway, <laughs> in so many different ways that humans aren't really, we didn't really invent concepts <laughs> that we think we did in some places. Yeah. We've just reiterated what's taking place organically within life everywhere. Zip codes. Post yeah. Yeah, this study also is uh, is groundbreaking because it uses a massively parallel RNA assay. They were able to investigate 8,000 genetic segments this way, and they were able to do it in days as opposed to weeks to months. Wow. So that is the crazy. yeah, the, the in in the past before the technology existed to allow this study to take place, it would have probably taken years to get through. They probably wouldn't have gotten to all of these genetic segments, the one at a time or two at a time or something. And now 8,000 at a time, which is just uh, that's scaling up our ability to discover. 
Yeah, and the the, the tracking and time, uh, location and time too. It's all yeah. very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot more to learn there, but yeah, there's a little RNA postal system in your cells very cool. that tells the RNA where to go. Do you have some good news for us today, Justin? I absolutely do. This is uh this is uh just good news. Blair, Blair, Blair is just shaking her head there. She's already frowning. Huh? Okay. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me ten times, also shame on me. <laughs> it's always shame on me if it's just <laughs> why why what are you doing that's so darn shameful is what I need to find out over there. Uh, yeah, uh, just good news. It's the uh, science news uh, segment that takes on the news you don't want to know about with the optimistic gusto of a one-legged spider on a high wire act. Wildfire edition. Just good news. Researchers at the University of Nevada published a study in the Journal of Advances in Modeling Systems. They found that our current large-scale wildfire seasons are only temporary and that in future decades, wildfire occurrences and, and intensity will decrease. This is quoting from Aaron Hanan, a University of Nevada Reno researcher with the university's experiment station and an assistant professor in the College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources. Boy, they put all of their departments under one roof. There are so many factors that we need to consider and better understand if we want to predict how the frequency, size, and intensity of wildfires will change over time. Our two studies that they, they published looked at how changes in temperature, rainfall, and atmospheric carbon dioxide may interact with the influence and influence plant growth, turnover, and decomposition, and how those processes in turn affect fuel loading, fuel moisture, and different plant communities, which are two key factors driving wildfire regimes in the West. And so the findings, wildfires drop in intensity, and that will come about thanks to global warming which will reduce plant growth rates with extreme heat conditions and accelerate the decay of dead plant material, thus reducing fuel for future fires. According to the forecasting models, wildfires should increase in intensity for a bit during the transition, but in 50 years, that will change and rates will come down dramatically. So, Because everything will have already burned. News. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, how, how long can everything burn if it's burned? Yeah. And yeah, and if, if growth rates well, are reduced, <laughs> then you don't have the regrowth. Yeah. And we can just stop managing these forests altogether. They're, They're just, just going to do the their whole own thing. Global warming thing is just going to burn itself out. <laughs> totally. Over the next 50 yeah. years. It's like a toddler having a tantrum. They just got to let them get it out. <laughs> yeah. And 50 years later, they'll finally be over it. <sighs> okay, so what you're telling me is that as climate change progresses and the fires continue to add to climate change and the carbon that's being lost, uh, carbon dioxide that's being pushed into the air and the lack of those reservoirs. Um, yeah, that's going to get worse. It'll go faster. So only a couple of decades. We just have to make it through like the next 15 or 20 years and then 50, and then less 50 fires. Years. 50 years, they'll be increasing. Uh, after 50 years, the modeling. Darn it. Okay, I was hoping bigger. just a couple of decades. Well, but that's no, that's good news. That the reduction, you know, 50 years. The reduction in plant matter doesn't make the CO2 level spike even higher that cause other problems that increase right. the prevalence the of fire. That, yes. You know, there's other things involved. Oh. Yeah. Oh. But with less plants, there'll be less wildfires. Don't you see? It's a self-sustaining system after huh. all. Just fabulous. Just fabulous <gasps> what good news oh justin what have you done uh blair yes tell us tell us about your wildlife oh so you know the whole take only pictures leave only footprints thing 
Yeah. It's uh wildlife photography might actually impact the environment that you're taking pictures of. And that's, you know, you're not physically leaving anything behind or taking anything away, but your presence could impact animals in the forest, as you might imagine. And so there have uh, long been concerns from scientists about the proximity of humans, specifically to nesting sites of birds, um, and that might that might negatively impact bird reproduction. And so Gun, uh, Guangxi University in China wanted to look into this in Nongong, which is a limestone tropical forest region in southern China. And they wanted to see uh, how bird photographers flocking to the area... <laughs> Um, following the discovery of Nongong bab babbler species there in 2008, impacted the nesting success of those birds. They were setting up their cameras close to the nests, and so that that was giving them amazing photographs. But would that impact the birds? And scientists in general thought, for sure, it's going to impact their ability to feed effectively and it's going to impact their success rate and survival rate overall surprise specifically nest predation was something they wanted to look at because um birds mammals and reptiles were killing about 60 percent up to 75 percent of the nestlings in these babblers but in the 12 months that they looked and looking at 277 bird nests, which covered 42 different species, they found that predation rates of nests that were photographed were 13.3%. Unphotographed nests had a predation rate of 62.9%. Awesome. Humans finally did something good by accident. Yes. So photographers increased the survival rate of bird nestlings. By the disrupting predators. Uh-huh. So they had huh? no effect at all, positive or negative, on their feeding rates. But they acted, quote, like a scarecrow and scared predators away. And, so, uh, you know, and, and, and our presence there probably lingers once we're gone. You know, the scent of human in the area to a lot of well, predators. Well, and the sound around it the dangerous. whole time you're driving out, you're hiking out, you're setting up your equipment, you're tearing down your equipment, your your sound and your impact can carry. So uh, all that can have an impact on whether predators feel like it's safe to go for out, out for dinner or not, you know. But so the, the thing that I think is interesting is we're assuming right away that this is a good thing. Oh. Because predators are not we eating baby birds. We forgot it's a food web. Right. And ah. so I just wanted to bring that up because I didn't really see that mentioned in at least the press release for this study. That in some cases, animals that are endangered or have other undue pressure on them, reducing predation can help an endangered or a protected species. But if you're just looking at a species that's doing pretty fine amongst other species that are doing pretty fine, if you disrupt predation, you can mess up an entire ecosystem. What if the predator is a protected species, for example? So it's it sounds like a one-sided win-win scenario, but I just want to throw out there not necessarily. Yeah. T talk about fool me once. <laughs> you, took, you really pulled the rug out from under that. Oh, yeah, humans I didn't know, do a good I thing know, after I all. Know. It seemed like we had a win. Disrupting nature is generally speaking not good. So it's, you if know, you it's love the nature, circle of life. If you love nature, don't ever go anywhere near it. That's yeah, true. I mean, it's That's just the, the question, lesson. are, are humans over. are humans the only wildlife appreciators on the planet? Are other, you know, as we, we find out that more and more species are sentient in some way or another and, you know, aware of their surroundings, how many go out and enjoy their ecosystem? Yeah. How many take a trip around just checking out the neighbors? Looking pretty good today over there, Bob. Looking good. All right. Okay, moving on from photographers bad, maybe. Humans bad. We're not going to just talk about humans bad. Let's talk about how, how humans died 
thousands of years ago from disease and famine and oh, no. drinking milk. Oh, no. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> So there's always been a question of uh, what, you know, what lactose tolerance has done for humanity. And only about a third of people on the planet have the gene to produce lactase, to break down the milk sugar in milks and not get gassy, awful tummies that yeah, cause a lot of discomfort. That's an amazing. So I I don't know anything about this. It's only a third of us who are who yeah. aren't weird. The majority of people Ooh. on the planet are intolerant to lactose. Oh man, I feel so much better. <laughs> oh gosh, I, mean, I didn't in realize Western that was culture, surrounded you would not by know this <laughs> because yeah, there's I, I so I much just, milk and cheese. Yeah, and yeah I, that just, just, that just means milk two thirds and... of people are walking around tooting a bunch. <laughs> yep. Without dairy, I don't know. I would have to find a different staple. Well, you can. There are different forms of dairy that have less lactose, but it's the okay. you know lactose is, from cattle specifically um, is there's a lot. The lactose is strong with the cattle, uh, sheep, and and goats have lower lactose concentrations, and so are a little bit better uh, handled by people. But this is not the story. It's why did this gene begin to spread? And it had a very rapid spread for a while, for a few thousand years, and then it's just kind of around. We're not seeing over the last two thousand years or so. We haven't continued to see this massive spread of tolerance to lactose. And why is that? Well, researchers at University of Bristol and University College London uh, published in Nature their study of prehistoric patterns of milk use over the last 9,000 years. And the genetic aspects of that milk use mapped into historic events and things that uh, could have been occurring historically. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so they were able to combine ancient DNA, radiocarbon, archaeological data, and use computer modeling to show that lactase persistence as a genetic trait was not common until around 1000 BC, nearly 4,000 years after it was first detected, and gosh, several thousand years after we had already started drinking milk farming cattle, sheep, goats, and drinking their milk as a nutritional uh, supplement. All right. So they are thinking lactase persistence got pushed to high frequency by some kind of turbocharging of natural selection. And so the researchers tried to figure what, out what that was. And looking at over 7,000 organic animal fat residues from 13,181 fragments of pottery from 554 archaeological sites dating from the earliest farming nearly 9,000 years ago, uh, they were able to show that this persistence came about because even though milk drinking and use was widespread, for healthy humans, it doesn't really give a benefit to, I mean, you might have a little bit of discomfort, right? But if you're sick, what is happening in your colon is that the milk, the lactase that's in the colon is drawing a whole bunch of water into your colon and can lead to diarrhea. And that, if you are already experiencing cholera, well, dysentery from other, from other sources, we famine. Know humans were Full of parasites. Yeah, they're parasites. Gosh, if you were, horrible. if if it was like a, you know, the Miserable Black Plague, or if it was, you know, a famine, where if you were healthy and you did and you had this uh, lactate lactase tolerance, um, it basically uh, allowed it allowed you to be able to survive these periods more easily. You had less diarrhea. Hmm. You digested your food better. So you were more likely to survive. So you were less likely to be pushed out of the yeah. hut on so, a cold night because of your incessant flatulence. 
Yeah. <laughs> so the people who could not handle the lactose were more likely to die. So that led to a survival benefit. And so the natural selection of this variant was supercharged during this very unhealthy and dangerous time in our evolution. Yeah. And yet so, somehow the weak managed to survive this and become the majority. <laughs> <sighs> yes. No, yes. Uh, but yeah, so we don't get sick as much. We don't have as much famine. And, you know, depending on where milk is had, our medical institutions mm -hmm. are better. Our practices are more sanitary. So there's, it's a overall a better world to live in. And so we don't really have this push for lact lactose um, digestion the way that we did in the past. So hence it's slowed, slowed down a bit, but mm -hmm. yeah. Human mortality drove this gene through our prehistory. Death by lactose. Any more stories for this first part of the show? Mm -mm. No, we've done that. Okay. Well, it's time for us to move on then. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of our science podcast. We bring you the news every single week. And if you're enjoying the show, please share it with a friend today. All right. I have a very quick COVID update for us. Um, you know how there's been a big debate as to the source of our current ongoing pandemic? <laughs> Did it come from the Wuhan animal market? Did yes. it come from a lab? Yes. Where did it come from? Bats. Been a, bats, like the baby. Yeah, right. I, I, I say yes Probably to bats. all of it. Huh. There, but there's sure, been evidence in, in, in many different directions, uh, but a group of epidemiologists uh, have published two studies this week in science uh, looking at the epidemiology of the original outbreak centering on Wuhan, uh, China, and the fish market, or not fish market, the animal market in, or yeah, it was a seafood market, actually, uh, centering on the seafood market and Additionally, um, looking at how the cases spread over time, the different genetic variants that, uh, that occurred, and they have come to the conclusion that the, Huan the Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan was the early epicenter of the COVID-19 epidemic. Their data does not support the idea that there was a lab breach. It, it does not support that it came from a lab. There are still many more questions to be had, but they have been able to uh, dig into the, da the data and see exactly how the spread uh, seems to just come from and center around this seafood market. Um, additionally, at that market, they have determined that there were not one, but two spillover events. So it's kind of like once there's a reservoir and the virus has gotten the ability to jump to humans, why would it just happen once? And so they have identified two slightly different genetic variants that uh, were about a week apart in their uh, in their spillover, but both at the Hunan seafood market. Yeah, I, and I, to my point of uh, agreeing with all the sources. As long as somebody is believing that like, this is how bad it was, as long as somebody is believing that COVID exists, they could say it's from anywhere. I don't care. Interestingly, a lot of the people who were making the argument that it came from a lab also didn't believe it existed, which I found, <laughs> I found very, very interesting. Yeah, that, uh, that raises a few eyebrows for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you know, anybody can't say anything, but that's not science, right? What we're doing is we're getting evidence to back up claims, not not relying on pure speculation. And yeah, it takes time. It's not the kind of thing that is going to be answered overnight, especially when it's a very complex analysis. Um, but it is a, you know, the 
I think the researchers who have worked on this should be very, very proud of the work that they've done and really kind of bringing this information, not to a complete close, but a pretty satisfying uh, and hopefully end of this discussion. <laughs> um, yeah, and it and was it was the original suspect. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You got to check all the options, all the, all the possibilities. Was it here? Was it there? Well, we've got different hypotheses. Let's test them. Let's see where the evidence goes and see what seems to be the strongest evidence. And that's and that's where you stand. Natural. It's natural. It was it's all natural. Just like those breads and cookies and other things that you eat. Oh, um, and by the way, this week, uh, the head of the World Health Organization, you know. This is I'm I'm seeing things ring similar to early stages of the pandemic uh, for COVID-19. However, this is a different situation. The World Health Organization chief has declared monkeypox an international emergency. An expert panel hasn't been able to reach a consensus. The CDC is still having issues. We don't have enough vaccines. We aren't testing people. Doctors aren't doing what needs to be done. And monkeypox is beginning to spread more and more widely. Why did we not learn any lessons huh. from the past? Our systems were obviously broken, and we don't seem to have repaired them. <laughs> oh. Again, things take time, I guess. Let's just hope that the monkeypox doesn't get us first. Uh, Although, I think with, with monkeypox, I I see some things with it that make me very skeptical of um, governments and just generally people's response to it, just because mm -hmm. of the way that it's talked about, the the way that like the tight the you know they talk about it spreading through specific communities and through specific mm -hmm. ways of transmitting. And that makes it feel very other to certain communities, often people yep. in charge of making these decisions. So if you say that it's, it's usually spread through sexual contact and that it currently is spreading in homosexual communities, then you put it in this category where it's not everyone's problem. Yep. And so I also it's, see it's it the, being... It's treating, it's how we treated HIV. Yes. When HIV yeah. was a, an initial problem. It and this so is a problem long for, for everyone. To be, yeah. You don't have to be having sex to get monkeypox and you don't nope. have to be gay to get monkeypox. You can, you can get it through touch with anyone for any reason at any time. So like, it's, this is not a specific problem for a specific set of people, but that is no. a convenient way to talk about it because then it doesn't have to be quote unquote, my problem to a lot of people making decisions. Yeah. Okay. But I, I feel that also like the, I don't know. You should, sometimes the stock market uh, talks the, there's a, the company that makes those vaccines, Bavarian something. Uh, I think it's a German uh, company. Uh, the when they, they first started talking about monkeypox, the stock jumped like 30 percent. And then and then they said, ah, oh, monkeypox is not a big deal. We don't have to worry about it. And it fell by half of its original value. And now it's like it's doubled uh, again. So, you know, the somebody's trying to react to this financially and just watching that one stock. I've been sort of watching that as the ticker of uh, of how I've tracked that news about whether or not we were going to do something yeah. about monkeypox. But what's interesting is it doubled before this announcement. So, so even without the, the World Health Organization coming out and saying anything, a lot of money found its way there the week of this announcement before yeah. it was announced. So there's also like, hmm, yeah. Uh, What's where's, happening here? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, I make sure to wipe down all surfaces in an airplane <laughs> before I touch them <laughs> with an antiseptic wipe. How am I going to touch this? Yes, I'm going to wipe it all down. So, uh, you know, there are practices we can do to all maintain our safety and to continue uh, having yeah, see, you know, normal and it's it I it is 
yeah, monkeypox is not as, as big of a threat at this point as COVID-19 is or was. Um, but and that's, Derek and that's, Schmidt is, is, is but it's in a the thing. chat room. He's saying Health Canada talked about it being a homosexual issue. Uh, right, because that's and, where it has showed up initially in many communities around the world. Are, is it, is our only, but it's not. It, uh, it's a people homosexuals problem. the only people who are hugging each other and having sex anywhere in uh -uh. this world? Is that uh -uh. insane? Yeah. Insane yeah. the way. Uh, yep. Although, other. although, you know, if they're the only community that gets the health warnings, you know, at least you know they got that going for them. But hey, we get the health warnings before anybody else does. At least that's nice, I guess. Uh, this is This Week in Science. Thank you once again for joining us for this episode. If you love this show and love to support this show, thank you very much for helping us out on Patreon. If you haven't yet joined our Patreon community and would like to, you can become a supporter of TWIST by heading over to our website, twist.org clicking on the Patreon button and heading over to our Patreon page where you can choose your level of support, $10 and more a month. And we'll thank you by name at the end of the show. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. And now we will come back to that time in the show that's full of, I guess this week, embryos. Mm -hmm. Blair's Embryo Corner. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? I have a story that I am very skeptical of, but I was fascinated by, and so I wanted to bring it for us to discuss. So first, I want to talk about the evolution of placental mammals. This is something that you are taught in, I would assume, high school biology these days. I don't know. But like if Virus you study, infected us. If you, if you study biology, especially zoology, you're going to hear all about the evolution of mammals and how we came from an egg-laying thing. And first, there were monotremes, which are egg-laying mammals. And then there were marsupials who birth out undercooked animals. They're not an egg anymore, but they are definitely undercooked. They like don't have all their legs. They're blind. They need to crawl through hair to continue cooking the rest of the way in a marsupium or a pouch. And then after that, we got the placenta. And with the placenta came the ability to grow big and strong and smart inside mom long enough to come out pretty well put together and either you have you're ready to go raring from the start like a giraffe or a horse or you're set up to be real smart like apes right and so either way cooking longer helps make this animal ready to go in one way or another when they come out of mom so this is how it's always been talked about this is the assumption based on the fossil record based on all the information we have but this week university of washington has new news for us. They found some evidence that they think tells us that another group of mammals, the extinct multi-tuberculates, likely reproduced in a placenta-like manner way before marsupials came onto the field. What? Yes. They split off from the rest of the mammalian lineage before placentals and marsupials. So... They themselves, while they were um, contemporaries with marsupials and placental mammals, their common ancestor came before marsupials. Therefore, either this is convergent evolution to placental growth, or marsupials came after the placenta. Now, let me tell you how they came to this conclusion, because I also think this is important. How did they discover that these multi-tuberculates were 
placental in in their development because they didn't find a fossilized pregnant animal with the placenta in it that they could see in the fossil that's like impossible so <laughs> what they found um was femurs thigh bones stay with me <laughs> they obtained cross sections of 18 fossilized femurs from multi multi tuberculates I don't, I'm not saying that right, but you get it. That lived approximately 66 million years ago in Montana. And all 18 samples showed the same structural organization, which was a layer of disorganized bones sandwiched between an inner and outer layer of organized bone. So you have your bone sandwich organized on top and bottom, a bunch of messy bone in the middle. Disorganized bone or woven bone, is sometimes what it's called, indicates rapid growth. Under a microscope, the layers of bone tissue are laid out crisscross. In what is called organized bone, which reflects slower growth, the layers are parallel. So they examined femoral cross sections taken from 35 small bodied ma mammals that are living today, 28 placentals, and seven marsupials. And all nearly all of the placental femurs so showed the same sandwich organization. And the marsupial femurs consisted almost entirely of organized bone with only a sliver of disorganization inside so based on this femur they think that these guys were placental in development the idea is that for tiny marsupial newborns the bones grow a lot more once they get inside the marsupium the pouch so they deposit a greater amount of outer organized bone before they exit to grow further in the pouch so it looks organized internally because they have to like use the bones way sooner. So based on this, they think that these multi-tuberculates had a lactation period of approximately 30 days, similar to rodents, and therefore that they were placental. So if this is true, then you have over here, you have your um, micro, mul micro, multi tuberculates. Then over here, you have your marsupials and your placental mammals. And the marsupials and placental mammals are closer related than these new guys, which means there is a common ancestor way further back. And so either the placenta developed twice or this type of development, because I also am going to say we didn't see a placenta. We don't know there's a placenta. There could be something else going on here. There could be an entirely different fourth strategy for growing a fetus that we don't know about. But so whatever it is that they're doing, if a placenta is involved, it happened convergently. It happened twice, or that was the original organization and marsupials popped out later for another reason. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So it's not as straight a path, not as cut like, and dried as we, like the, as we considered it. Interesting. I like the second. Uh, I, Interpretation. That yeah, marsupials think, came later? Yeah, that the, the, they developed a, a, a secondary uh, strategy. So the way it was explained to me in school that made it see, sound like so much sense, and I'm going to see if I cannot butcher this, without a whiteboard. If I had a whiteboard, we could do a lot better. But so um, yeah. monotremes, they lay eggs. Part of the reason that they do that is that their, uh, their embryo, their like blastocyst basically is uh, very smooth and it like doesn't, it can't really like gain purchase on the uterine wall properly. So it can't, there's not a lot of exchange between the growing monotreme and the mom. So it has to get out of there. It has to be self-contained and get out into an egg because mom cannot provide for it. A marsupial has like, it's it's like wrinkly kind of on the edge of the blastocyst. And, it's, and so that allows for it to embed in the uterine wall temporarily, do some gas exchange. It gets what it can, but at a certain point, it can't grow any bigger with what it's getting from mom. And so it has to kick out to be able to grow further externally. In placental mammals, they develop a whole placenta. And the blastocyst before that 
is extremely wrinkly, has like fingers all over it properly. So right. so it can embed in the uterine wall extremely well. It has really good um, blood and um, gas exchange. It can get nutrients from the placenta. And so it is good to go in there for a long time. And so based on that description, it sounds like the blastocyst is getting more and more complex. And in compl right. if we think about moving towards complexity, that makes sense in a progression. So that story sounds great, but you're right. It's not always like that. Well, now I want to reverse my answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, after your description, uh, which totally makes sense, uh, I would say that the marsupials must have originated earlier than we think. And that, that transformation that was taking place uh, hit a point where it was just working and didn't need to go through that progression or that advance or that mm -hmm. le uh, mm -hmm. further complexity because it hit a point where it had figured out how to make that work and stopped uh, changing uh, in that direction. We do know also that sometimes traits are lost. So mm -hmm. there, you know, there is not always the progressive march toward complexity. We know right. that it's not always... This that, that what looks like the, convergent the or divergent that went back we can have the things that we talked diverge. about. Diverge. Mm -hmm. yeah. The the other argument for marsupials being more primitive is that they are prevalent on islands. Yes. And when the way evolution works, there's island biogeography and, and primitive traits or more um kind of older and less advantageous traits are allowed to continue and persist because there's less selective pressure because they're on an island. So the fact that Australia is full of marsupials and there, there's not a lot elsewhere helps feed this theory as well. But, but without getting are, deeper in the, but what, there are, yeah. like, what that story. example that was up there was like a, a, a North American uh, opossum. Yeah. There's one. Opossum. In North America, we have one marsupial. But I mean, unless yeah, that, on the island opossum, of North America. Yeah. yeah that opossum, <laughs> the, you know, isn't like, doesn't look like the most uh, travel hardy critter you know it didn't look like it crossed an ocean so we're, we're talking it had to be marsupial marsupializing it uh territories back in the uh, pangea type type yep. i mean that's a long time ago <laughs> certainly I mean. yeah all of this all got got its start a very long time ago Blair, let's keep talking yes. about other embryos. Who yes. else do you want to talk about? I want to leave you with a nice image to go to sleep to, which is a baby marmoset silently screaming from within the womb. Good night, everyone. Even better, how about a human baby screaming silently from within the womb? You're welcome. So this is a study looking at baby marmosets and how it appears that they practice face and mouth movements necessary to call their family for help before they are born from within the womb. This may also apply to humans as ultrasounds in the third trimester of pregnancy have shown developing humans in the womb to make crying like movements. So keep an ear out for future studies on that one. Um, that just sounds terrifying to go in for your third trimester ultrasound and to see your baby screaming. I just, anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so marmosets are a perfect example to look at this because they are an extremely social primate. Uh, they have to call their family members for help. They can do so within 24 hours of being born. And so it's really important for them to be able to do that. Um, this is from, a. Uh, the Department of Psychology and the Princeton Neuroscience Institute at Princeton University in New Jersey. And they conducted ultrasounds two to three times per week in four pregnant marmosets for a total of 14 to 17 ultrasound sessions per marmoset. It's a lot of teeny tiny jelly and teeny tiny ultrasound uh, machines. Oh my God. So cute. Marmosets are really cute. You guys should Google it if you have not uh, looked at a marmoset recently. Anyway, um, the face first became visible on an ultrasound and immediately thereafter, um, they started seeing movements that they could measure. They did scans to lauded, long, longitudinally track the head, face, and mouth. 
and they compared them with newborn marmoset's movements when they called. In frame-by-frame -frame analysis, um, they found that head and mouth movements coordinated initially, but the mouth movements became distinct over time, and eventually they became nearly indistinguishable for movements made by crying newborn marmosets separated briefly from their mothers within the first 24 hours after birth. They just to be sure they also compared it to pre and postnatal licking movements and movements associated with what they call twitters, which is another vocalization that is not a distress call. And these were in fact distinct and distinct and specific to calls that they made when they were separated from their mother. So this shows that they are practicing this behavior before they can even generate sound because, you know, they're in fluid and stuff. And um, these movements in marmosets may help scientists learn more about social vocalizations in other primates, primates and their developments, including, of course, us. Hmm. So they're practicing before they even come out. Yeah. You got to have practice. Yeah. Practice is important. Certainly. And why not start practicing before you have to, you know, jump up on stage? Mm -hmm. This is This Week in Science. Justin, you're looking bright and happy and cheery on this Thursday oh, yeah. morning. The sun is, yeah. Uh, yeah. What kind of, what Thursday kind of, Thursday morning is well underway. Yeah. What kind of science do you so, have for uh, us for your section yeah, right now? Last science story. So NASA, NASA has canceled the retriever robot that was supposed to go up what? there and collect all of those rock core samples. No. Yeah. What? Yeah, the ExoMars rover sidelined due to a war with Ukraine, uh, with Russia, Russia oh. between Russia and Ukraine. Russia was actually supposed to provide the rocket ride. It was a, a part of a joint mission in the European Space Agency and the U.S. and and Russia were involved. And uh, yeah, cut, everybody cut ties. People are getting crazy. So they might still launch it. NASA's looking at it right now. They they I guess they put it into storage, mothballed it, and we'll decide later on this decade. Uh, well, we'll, see, we'll, decide, we'll decide whether or not they can still launch it later this decade, sometime in the fall. They'll make a decision. However, NASA is going to go ahead and uh, move ahead with a plan B that they announced this week to retrieve the core samples from Mars with mini helicopters. Actually, that's plan C. Under the new plan, NASA's Perseverance, Perseverance rover already on Mars, ma making the, the course, needs to go and collect all those little droppings that it made, it needs to pick up after itself, and take those to a rocket, which will oh. then launch them off of the red planet a decade from now. Perseverance but we still have already... to get a rocket there. This is adding to Perseverance's job, picking up after itself. So the oh. rocket that goes there was already part of a plan. Uh, that's how we were, we're, we're going to, basically Mars is going to attack Earth with yes. by firing <laughs> rockets at the Earth <laughs> filled with these little core samples. That was already part of the plan, but this Exo rover was supposed to be going up and collecting everything, going everywhere Perseverance had been and picking up those the samples. There's 11 of them so far, the, uh, and more rock drilling is planned. Actually, I think there's more than 11. I think that might be... Anyway, there's at least 11 lying on the surface of Mars right now. Uh, yeah, well, there's a quote, somebody's got to do the from, pickup work. That's great. From, for NASA. Diversity of materials already in the bag, so to speak, and really excited about the potential for bringing these back. So if Perseverance gets stuck, if it breaks down, NASA's got the plan C part of this, which is it's sending two helicopters, kind of like the little Ingenuity helicopter that's there already. Yeah. It's sending two helicopters uh, that are going to launch later this decade to go and pick up those samples with something called a uh, necrobotic spider claw <laughs> and, and yeah. carry them 
to the rockets. Right, the neck, the neck robots, uh, created by uh, Mar Martian spiders. Yes. Yeah. Dead Martian. But yeah, spiders. these choppers, good, the good. new choppers, uh, are gonna have wheels and grappling arms. Nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Might as well bring some spiders. Event. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Oh my goodness. Oh NASA, yeah, America, not American, but global political issues. It's good to have global partners, but it's. A shame and speaking when of which, things go awry. What? Speaking of global partners. Okay, so yeah. here's a, the end of the show rant that uh, I, I, I read about this thing in this article a couple places. And so I had to talk about it a little bit. So in the early 1980s, for those of you who weren't on the planet yet or just don't remember, the world was hearing warnings from the scientific community, not about global warming so much, but about a hole in the ozone layer. You remember this? Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Ozone layer, the atmosphere, the ozone uh, is this layer in the atmosphere that naturally protects Earthlings and all of Earth's inhabitants from the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. Without it, we could not live on the planet very long, or at least not on the surface. So, so, so dire was the warnings. Nations of Earth got together under something called the Montreal protocol and they all signed commitments to res to remove the ozone depleting chemicals from industry and consumer goods and it CFCs. works yeah they got rid of the cfcs the uh, hole is still there it grows and it shrinks from year to year but it's considered contained at this point no longer yeah. a looming growing threat to human uh health or earthling uh, existence Right. We've moved on to other ways of threatening our existence. <laughs> a decade later, the world uh, heeded the warnings of science once again, took up the challenge of combating global warming by agreeing to cut carbon emissions under commitments made via the Kyoto Protocol. Different this time is uh, at the same time that that was taking place, the American Petroleum Institute no doubt seeing what had happened to the CFC industry, I guess, and how quickly world governments acted to get rid of a dangerous, harmful pollutant, get rid of that threat, to, to minimize that threat. Sent out, created a memo, which has been now called the Victory Memo, sent out a memo to its fossil fuel industry members, which support it, which is why it even exists, the American Petroleum Institute, which gets only donations from big oil companies, sent out a memo to its fossil fuel industry members laying out a plan to combat the public's perception of climate science. This report was eventually leaked to the New York Times a long time ago, and it is totally crazy. Uh, and I just felt like I, I read about I, I had not read this before. I think I'd heard, you know, obviously that there was, we've all heard that, they, oh, they're conspiring with misinformation. That was obvious that scientists were going forward who were uh, oil industry backed, who were doing this global denying, especially in the earlier days. But I'd never didn't, wasn't aware that this memo existed that detailed, that listed how they were planning on going about it. Uh, yeah. There's a link to that memo on our website now and the show notes once the, the show is published. Uh, but the multi-million dollar plan, which included dollar amounts, Included also outreach to politicians, media organizations, and journalists. It stated that they would like to convince a national TV journalist, and this is no joke, they named a journalist in writing in the memo as an example of somebody they would like to have examine science behind the Kyoto Protocol. And they named John Stossel, <gasps> who, as it happens... The Stossel from, Report, yeah. Went from being a consumer content journalist who was like, hey, watch out for this scam, uh, to becoming a dedicated, single-minded climate change denier and minimizer in all yeah. of the years since. Even now, still doing it, getting banned uh, from YouTube and Twitter and other places for misinformation and still complaining about, about it and still... After receiving lifetime funding from oil industry sources, the guy who used to say, give me a break, finally got his big break as a shuckster. 
So yeah. they lay, but it's just so incredible reading this is the game plan. The they lay out in the memo creating a pipeline of information uh, to, and this is also their words used in the memo to undercut conventional wisdom on climate science hmm. by producing and distributing op-ed pieces to newspapers by That's offering good. scientists uh, of their own to go on shows uh, and media to talk about climate uh, science from their perspective. The plan stated it would develop and disseminate radio news releases nationwide. Disseminate radio news releases. Because if you're the oil industry in America, you have ready access to put whatever message you like out as news on nation wide radio programs apparently because because there was no there's no line in there about needing to convince mm -hmm. radio news sources or make contacts in radio news journalism it was just a given that they could do it because of course nationwide radio in america is controlled by like mostly one company even if you have 30 stations that you can tune into on your local radio there's probably no more than three companies, if you don't count uh, PBS, that control all of those stations. And they have a very conservative slant. So anyway, target audience of the oil industry remain largely misinformed to this day about scientific uh, consensus and coming consequences. They specifically uh, were targeting Republican audiences, not by accident, as this would uh, easily, this would easily uh, led to the COVID misinformation after decades of devaluing scientific expertise on their information, radio, broadcast, television systems. Meanwhile, global warming continues to produce hotter heat waves, wilder wild, wildfires, hairier hurricanes, severe storms, sea levels that won't stop till they reach the top. A Supreme Court ruling last month limited the federal government's ability to regulate carbon emissions from power plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't actually read that decision, but I assume it's because power plants don't have vaginas and therefore legally should not be the subject of government control. Point is, uh, 1998 oil companies laid out an industry memo in an industry memo, a point by point by point strategy that they would use to influence a misinformation campaign. And then they followed through with it. How is this not a criminal act? It's a great question. Because we were watching a conspiracy theorist, uh, on one, a couple of them, one who lied about voting, some who were lying about voting machines, others who characterized a school shooting as a false flag operation. And they're, finance, they're, they're facing financial consequences in defamation lawsuits right now. Where is that justice system reaction to an industry that intentionally lied about climate science for decades while they knew from their own internal research that it was taking place, man-made and fossil fuels were behind it? It's because they themselves generated a system so that they could not be prosecuted within it. So basically, they have created a, a, an air of doubt and a situation where um, it is difficult for the average person or the average senator, I'll say, to point at specific mm -hmm. tragedy and say, yes, that is climate change. And therefore, it is difficult to blame them for the results of climate change if you can't identify it. So basically, like, it's the idea, it's the idea that still that like climate change is far away. And it's a big idea. And we haven't seen the the results of it yet. But we have. It's just yeah. people don't understand that we have. They see, uh, you know, the results of wildfires or they see the results of pandemics or they see the results of poverty. They don't mm -hmm. understand that climate change is part of all of that. And so climate change has caused death, has caused hardship. That has happened. But that... that um, Kiki, you're muted. Well, my, my point is- it's going to get worse. It's yes. going to get worse. But yeah. the, yeah. And the, the it, what's at issue here though, is these were, you know, they ostensibly 
the facts as they understood them. And so they are sharing their understanding of the climate science and preying on the media's uh, need to share both sides, the both sides of is ism of media, um, making sure that they can get in the media, in, get media attention. Um, yeah, there are lots of that's, aspects that's to this. Question, but though, yeah, is, it was all laid is, out. Are, did the people who did this, did they really not understand? No, or, they're greedy. Greedy. Right. Or did they think that they would be so rich that climate change couldn't reach them? Or did they not care about their own children? I'm going to say all so, those things. Yeah. So, so my, uh, <laughs> so in my connecting my in my earlier part of the, the story and connecting the CFC ban and how quickly we responded after that is I think what may have actually gotten so much of an effort, concerted effort behind attacking uh, the science behind global warming because we got rid of CFCs and the fossil fuel industry had seen that happen in the previous decade and thought, oh, they might uh, move on from us just as quickly. Uh, but but my, right. my whereas was, CFCs could be replaced with other chemicals that are harmful in different ways, yeah. um, you know, fossil fuels don't have an easy replacement. Well, so and the, they do actually. They do. But, I mean, but, they, also, but in the in the minds of the fossil fuel industry, you know, they're not going from fossil fuels to oh look, we're doing solar. They're not yeah, doing but, that. But also or CFCs, nuclear, or, a lot of the whatever, ways yeah. CFCs were used was fairly novel. So it was also something that like, oh, we can change our hairspray and our aerosols and all these things that have only well, been around for those are some of the decades. Those are some of the consumer goods. But in industry, it was used quite a bit more for a lot of other purposes. Right. Uh, but I don't think as long is my point. I don't think CFCs were around as long as petroleum has been around. And so it, was, it wasn't as ingrained as in, into infrastructure yeah. and there weren't as many lobbyists for CFCs. The, a lot of people that worked in CFCs could very easily pivot to other industries or replace it with a different again harmful chemical in another way <laughs> but but my point yeah, so, was uh yeah. about about the need for the justice system or some uh some legal action to take place isn't so much about the damages that we know have been done to environment economy and health which are huge mm -hmm. But if you if you look at those other lawsuits that are that are taking place against people who did disinformation knowingly or should have looked at a source without sources, defamed companies, defamed uh, a such a horrible uh, tragedy of children being called and called them crisis actors. The the this effort was a defamation of the scientific community. They were making claims over and over again, perpetuating them, generating op-eds, generating fake news stories that was defaming uh, climate science, defaming the uh, from academic and uh, institutionals all across the, the world. So I don't think you had in that case to show all of the damage they have done to make that to make that case. You you have a you have a, a lie you have knowledge that it's a lie and you have an effort to perpetuate the lie that's all you need. And according to a March fifteenth article from Reuters, a federal appeals court on Tuesday rejected Exxon Mobil Corp's effort to stop Massachusetts and New York from probing whether the oil company lied to investors and the public regarding what it knew about climate change. So yeah, uh, there are legal probes that's, underway, I'm, and at this it, point, there is a fed. There, there are things in process. It's yeah, but it's, it's decades point. later. It's one but of the few things where misrepresenting on. misrepresenting uh, your company to your investors maybe the only way <laughs> you can get them is by giving money to the people who profited from them. Yeah. Great. <laughs> uh-huh uh, so I, for my wait. last two stories i'm going to move on to some uh lighter topics some uh topics <laughs> you know brief and fun to end our end our tight 90 uh 
ants. We love ants. Ants are cool. We know they have interesting pheromonal behaviors that allow for coordinated activities. And it's like, oh, they're like acting like individual neurons or something. They're like acting like one big organism. Maybe they're these these colonies, these hives, maybe they do have a hive mind, right? There are these analogies that we come up with when we're we're talking about these colony-based organisms. Well, researchers at Rockefeller University were looking into this group behavior of ants, and they have determined, based on mathematical modeling of behavior, of uh, a specific behavior for ants dealing with a hot environment and whether when they choose to leave. So at a certain temperature, it gets too hot and they want to save their eggs. They need to save their little larva and move away. And what is the, the cutoff for that? Is it always the same for every colony? How do they make this decision? They reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that as temperatures uh, uh, rise, individual ants start to kind of make little changes to their behavior. But things kind of carry along generally for the colony as normal until all the ants as a group make a decision and decide to leave. They found that smaller colonies of just 30 to 40 ants would leave, make that decision to leave at a lower temperature than a larger colony of ants of a, a group of about 200 to 300 ants. So the smaller group decided 34 degrees Celsius was it. They had to go. The larger group, they maintained their colony up to 36 degrees Celsius, which is a bit, a bit hotter and can have physiological effects. Those two degrees can have differences. So uh, what is it that allowed this decision-making sensory response to hit a different threshold. Uh, and they they believe that it is group dynamics and the based on the behavior of the ants in their colonies, they determined that they're kind of like, it's kind of like a neural net that you can have one neuron having a little behavior, but you don't make a decision. So if some, one neuron on your brain is going beep, 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 I'm making noise, you should do something, you're not really, your brain as a whole, the network isn't making a decision and changing your behavior. But when a whole bunch of them start doing that, suddenly, oh, I have an idea. I need to do something and I need to change my behavior. Um, that, so this neural net threshold comes about basically as a matter of probability and that ants in a colony don't since they, they don't know how big the colony is, but altogether their behaviors influence the whole. And so it's all probability based and they act like a neural net. That, are, you, are you sure it's not just that, uh, not just counting the votes? And it's a small group, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, a little tiny. Oh, hey, like, oh, hey, wait, 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 hey, wait, 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 yeah. oh, we got to count all over again. Yeah, quit moving around. <laughs> Put your antenna down if you're not voting. We're not voting yet. Oh, this is going to be too hard. Yeah. So they don't know exactly why a higher temperature is what's the threshold for the larger group of ants. But uh, th what they're thinking is that it could be that the larger the size of the colony, maybe the harder it is to get everybody on the same page and to relocate. Maybe there's just more, more larvae to deal with, more food stores. Like it's just moving is hard when you have more people. Also, you know, it's like, hurting cats um it's like do they because somebody has to go and like build the new digs right like you can't just go you got to find a new place you got to build a new layer or labyrinth or whatever right? an under ant hill thing is but called. do the ants know that the individual ant maybe they don't know how big the colony is do they know how hard it's gonna be why would that be a deciding factor but anyway it's these little little individual activities that percolate up, create a lot higher probability of change, and at some threshold probability, change happens, just like in a neural net. Uh, and then my final story is very coming back to my the beginning of the show, artificial intelligence. How do how do artificial intelligences understand the universe? How do they 
how, to, how we program them and what they learn. Um, how can how can they learn the complexities of human language from our metaphors and our analogies, our fables, our stories? You know, you can tell you can you can tell young children fables. Fables have meaning. They're often meant to teach about greed or they have a lesson at the end. You know, don't steal the, the tarts. That's bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in uh, medieval times, there were lots of tarts going missing. That is lots true. Of... <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, this is uh, not a peer reviewed paper, but it is uh, was a presentation at a qualitative reasoning workshop with the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence that took place this last week. And the researchers from uh, USC were looking at understanding narratives through dimensions of analogy. And they tried to basically read fables to AIs that they had created to get this machine learning system to see if they if the machine learning system would understand commonalities and be able to recognize themes so it's like i mentioned before if there's a uh, several different fables but all of them teaching lessons on the topic of greed would an ai a machine learning ai be able to understand that the that greed is bad that these all are about this topic of greed would they be able to to pinpoint that and the answer is no. No, they couldn't. The AI machine learning was not able to understand the human analogies. They were not able to understand these human uh, concepts. They were not able to conceptualize what was in these fable-based stories. Um, but what the researchers did say uh, is that they actually learned a lot about humans and human understanding, because as they were going through the process of developing the materials to teach the AI, they found that the understanding of analogies very often is based on experience and where one researcher would say, oh, no, these two stories are alike. Another researcher might not have categorized them in that way. Huh. And so even among the humans who were trying to put together a study with which to train AI in this topic, the humans huh. had discrepancies that, and, and, and categories that were not so cut and dried. And so there's a lot they think there's a lot more there that we need to understand about the way that experience impacts our ability to understand metaphor, story, analogy, and um, and how how those differences vary from person to person. And so these nuances of human analogical reasoning need to be understood before we can start implementing them for AI technologies for a teaching AIs. How do we teach the AIs if we don't even understand ourselves? Well, I think that's the trick, right? You have to find out what priming is necessary yeah. to understand a fable. If you just pump like Disney movies into an AI for a certain amount of time before that, then they'll understand something. right and wrong and good and bad. And, and important maybe water. Work, right? yes, they'll so. understand water is something that a young woman contemplates uh, before going on her journey. Right. Water? <laughs> it's a theme in like every Disney movie is that every princess has water that she stares at at some point. Oh, gosh. For, you know, except for uh, The Little Mermaid. That's funny. Who stares well, at every Disney movie has a par has parents that die. Yes. So what is that teaching the AIs? Yeah. Dead parents and important <laughs> But But water. that's what I'm wondering. If, like, <laughs> if, if pop culture and stories that mm -hmm. we expose our children to as they grow up prime them for this because they have a sense of right and wrong and justice, right? Just like, mm -hmm. is that the theme that you need first to then understand understand the uh the metaphors that exist in these other stories yeah it's there has to be a level where suddenly the ai gets it and i think yeah. that's where you'll start to understand like the specifics how yeah it, uh, yeah what know, makes it work yeah yeah you, what you do is you just gotta feed it a steady diet of mulanas rudin sufi stories and it'll come out of the other end 
very wise, but also very, very kind of snarky. <laughs> Oh, you I want to answer AI. every uh, question with another question. Just like, oh gosh. <laughs> truly wise, truly wise humans are like the most annoying people to be around. Why would you say that, Justin? They never give you a straight answer. Because they're, they're all Who about teaching answers you anyway. Wise. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and play, play off being wise. <laughs> By just just speaking in in questions and why does that reasons. bother you, Justin? <laughs> well, because I keep asking questions, and I know there's oh, see, you're doing it to me again. Oh, it's fool me. I start to try to find out something, and then they try to get me to introspect about a thing, and it's I don't have time for that. I just want the answers to everything. Well, we had a few answers today. We had a lot more questions, and I do hope that. You enjoyed this episode of Twists once again. We've made it to the end, have we not? We have. I think we have. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. It is time for us to say a few thank yous to specific individuals. Many, many shout outs to Fada for help with social media and descriptions over on YouTube show notes. Gord for manning the chat room. Identity 4 for recording the show. And Rachel for Oh, your wonderful editing and assistance. And I would love to thank our Patreon sponsors for all of their support that allows this show to keep going. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Shefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Ragan, uh, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Aaron, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Vote Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima. Did that change things? Ah. Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rabin, Brendan Pier Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Jimmy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artie Am, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Ronnie Lewis, Paul, Philip Sheen, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, James Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E. Oak, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simile, Patrick Pacararo, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Uh, maybe while you clean up all the dead spiders around your home, just search for and this in science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, links to the stories and maybe even some show notes will be available via our website, www.twist.org. And you can even sign up for the uh, newsletter that Blur's about to send out, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After Justin writes some content for it, for sure. Um, <laughs> you can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten this week in .com, Justin at twistedunion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist T W I S in the subject line, or as you might have guessed, your email will be picked up by a dead spider and dropped into a bin where we will never read it. Oh, no. You can also uh, hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, and at Jackson Fly. Oh, and then at Blair's Menagerie. We yeah. love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Oh, there it is.
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just... And that's the end. I that's wish it. Was, there was a better fade on that thing. <laughs> Yeah, the fade is a little croop. That's it. I'm trying. I tried. I tried. I tried to slide the slider for the volume control down. Yeah. But the yeah, it didn't work as smoothly as I would have liked. But it yeah, it's nice. I like having all this music in here. It's I guess you could make a ver you could trim one that fades out and upload that version of it so it would fade out on its own. Yeah. Yep, yep. That would be the way to do it. <laughs> I I think I have that that Rachel made it for me. Oh, nice! So I have it. I just oh, have to, I'll, I'll download it and download it and upload it. Download, upload, download, upload. Good, yeah. good. So Justin disappeared to go for morning things. I needed a necrobot to do the slider. I did. Oh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for everybody for joining us. This tight, the tight 90 got a bit long in the tooth at the end. It was, I mean, it was pretty close to 100. I feel like that's pretty good. It started a couple of minutes past eight and we went to like 940 something. Yeah. Yeah. I try. I do try. I, I love it. See, when I get, when I'm like, okay, and then we're going to, and there's the, no, no, I just want to say one last thing. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. This Fine. will be cut. <laughs> <laughs> one last thing. It's always one last thing. I think about doing that sometimes, and then I'm like, this will be cut. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's all good. Oh, great. Derek. Derek says it was a tight show. Lots to learn, not much deviation. We did stay on topic. It was pretty good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we, were, we stuck to it, and there were good conversations in there. But I think, yeah, I don't know. I think just Justin's question of why aren't we doing anything to uh, legally have Ugh. repercussions on the climate change disinformation campaign, I think there is stuff happening. Yeah, Very and I still, I still, what I did a bad tr job trying to explain is I feel like if you could easily and succinctly point at something and go, this death is because of climate change and somebody yeah. couldn't fight you about it, it would be yeah. infinitely easier to, to legally fight this battle. And yeah. I think that's part of the problem is that like these other things that people are being taken to task for, there is there are clear victims and yeah. um, the way that it's communicated, it can be explained away as, and, and the waters can be muddied very easily as to the cause. Yep. And so that's why I was trying to say it's like feeding itself, right? Like the disinformation campaign makes it harder mm -hmm. to actually convict anyone of doing a disinformation campaign that is harmful. I don't know because, because <laughs> the, the whole point though, is that, I did not know this document existed. Really? But it is, yeah. Uh, hmm. But it, read through it, and there's the link in our show notes. It lays out the plan for disinformation step by step 
item by yeah. item, named John Stossel by name as an example of a TV journalist with notoriety who they could co-opt. Named him in their internal document. This was not a public press release. This was supposed to be an, supposed to be an internal memo to the oil company fossil fuel industry on how they were going that to leaked. create this this counter narrative about climate change. And so, I, and so, I, I think I think you have a point. If we don't know that there was a premeditated effort. Which we knew, but but that premeditated but, effort uh, could very easily be explained away as it's a free market. This is my business. I am doing what I need for my business to succeed. It is a marketing strategy. End of story. And that is have, the problem. Yeah, we do have laws though yeah. that uh, that are there to keep businesses from lying to potential clients there you know there there are departments of our government that are supposed to regulate advertising and marketing and make sure that you know people are not falling prey to pyramid schemes that they're not falling prey to lies right. Right. that are going to harm them in some way but all you have to do is look at a nutrition facts table on the side of food to recognize that in a in a in a capitalist society, they will find ways around that to yeah. market their products, and that's what this is about. Is about okay. What are where are the lane lines? I'm going to find every way I can possibly contort myself around them to market my product and confuse mm -hmm. people into buying it. Mm -hmm. But if ahead of having scientific content at the ready to counter the well, how did, how did they, the prevailing, uh, the conventional wisdom among scientists? If you yeah. use the, ahead of having any of that information, then I'm going to put out news stories that counter it. I'm going to put them right onto the radio news that goes nationwide. Yeah. Aren't you admitting that you are about to uh, hornswoggle yeah. middle America? Yeah. Yep. I'm a hornswoggle these people into not choosing better vehicles. And, and, and 100% it, real juice, Justin. That's all I have to say. 100% real of, juice. Part of it, well, you know, if you can if you can juice uh, get juice out of a bioreactor, well then it's, it's juice. Isn't it? You can buy a box real. of juice that says on it 100% real juice and it is corn syrup and water. Yep. You know what I wish? I wish we had juice like they have juice in, in Europe. In Europe, you go into the store and there's like these wonderful rows of just like apricot nectar, mango juice. Well, you were in France. Dairy juice. Like the juices are amazing. Why are well, our juice selections so If you're so talking about dumb? food, there's upsides and downsides. So and I Europe has mistake. better produce than we do. No. They do France not. France has an amazing produce. They that might be, but I'm up here in Denmark. And oh, but you also me, were there when it's doubt. when the sun's out. <laughs> it's possible if you summer. were there during what the winter. What are you winter. comparing it to? California has yeah. the best produce on the planet. There's, I've never been anywhere that's got as, as good a produce. California, as California. Davis, California, and, is the source of the flavor saver tomatoes, which ruined tomatoes for everyone. They might and, last longer, but they don't, they're not flavorful. They're bland. They're terrible. And I Western the United like States them. actually has the additional benefit of having uh, Bad geneticists. the reverse, uh, reverse seasons directly to the South. So that, you know, if something's out of season in, in California, North America, whatever, uh, it's the shortest shipping route from South America where it's in the right season again. And so it kind of, but I mean, yeah, you're still not buying local. It's That's not local. Good. That's it's not local. In your, uh, yeah, you're staying in your continental. Uh, <laughs> you're staying in your one canal separating. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. We had to dig that. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all one thing. But I made the mistake of buying two loaves of bread. Oh, did you put them in the refrigerator? Yeah, I put them in the refrigerator. Didn't help. They don't 
preserve. They don't put in the preservatives. Like I'm used to oh, getting right. a loaf of bread and it can sit in a cabinet unrefrigerated for a month and it's fine. I mean, if you're buying fresh bread, like a loaf, like wonderful loaf of bread. No, not like the wrapped, like, sliced, the thing that you would normally sandwich bread that you would normally be put in a cupboard for it be good for a month. It's good for like a week. If even that. You have to eat everything right away because it's all, it's like pre-rotting when you buy it. Like, I can't tell you how Don't many times I much, bought produce and, yeah. and it at, goes a, bad. at a store, brought it home, and then discovered this went bad a while ago. But that's a, maybe a Denmark problem. We, they, they, we do have to import everything here from other parts of Europe. Like, every all the, most of the good produce comes from like Spain and France. Yeah, but uh, a lot from Spain. A lot comes from Spain. But uh, I mean, not to say there's there's good stuff. There's good. Denmark has a plenty of. I try to buy local. You just have to eat it right away. You can't have a fridge full of food that you're gonna get. Well, to. that's. I mean, that's you the European. Prep, and that's that like the day. European style is the daily trip to the store. You get what you're, you need that day for that. Yeah, yeah, meal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before COVID, that well, sure. I'll yeah. wander on down to the old time market. I'll stop. And, they, and literally, you can go and stop by the butcher, the baker. Hey, need a the candle? candlestick? Go makers. buy the candlestick yeah. makers. This is really how Denmark is set up. It's, it's, I love that. It's a quaint fairy tale town that the, the big shine, the big glass and steel buildings with the nice marble lobbies or whatever right in the heart of downtown Copenhagen, aren't hedge funds, not an oil company investment, they're union headquarters. Those are the union, because everybody is part of a union and they are what drive. So everything is consumer and worker friendly. I yeah. think their non-organic produce in Denmark has a higher standard than American uh, organic produce. Insane, insane. Like if you want to uh, eat right and, and be healthy, this is a place you can do it. But uh, gosh, you got to eat it right away. Oh, they don't know. They don't preserve stuff. It's not the. This is not the. Is the Shrek of his fairy tale town? So, <laughs> but it's not. It's not like a fairy tale town, like a Shrek town. Wait. You know the the closest thing I can I could compare it to is if anybody and this is nobody's going to get this reference. It reminds me of the village that uh, the prisoner was living in from like the 1960s, which was a uh, which is actually a, a a British town that was built by a, like a British millionaire to look like a French town. Are you talking so about the island convoluted. that he was on? But it wasn't actually an island. There's an actual town that a, a multi-millionaire in, in England had built that looked like uh, an older French village, but architecture-wise. But it wasn't. Anyway, it's hard to explain. But that's kind of how it feels. It feels like it's some sort of... Do you often get chased home by a giant bubble? <laughs> <laughs> only, no, only, only, uh, that only happens if I go to the beach. Oh, okay. Good, good. Yeah. Derek Schmidt. Yay, Justin, for long memory. Of, of useless information. You want some useless information? Well, I got it at the ready. Right there. Right there. Why don't why don't you write me a newsletter article about some of that? I just get, I'll just copy and paste the thing I wrote for my rant at the end of the show. That might be, might be good enough. But everybody already heard that. So then what's the point? Ah, shouldn't have used it. You. I think just, I think just I, don't call me out for not writing a newsletter when I'm waiting on you for content. <laughs> Word to the wise. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's very fair comment. <laughs> Except that that kindly worded uh, ad, ad, um, ad, ad, how do you say it? Ad, 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 admonition? 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 Admonished. Admonition. Admi I feel uh, uh, kindly admonished. Thank you. <laughs> kindly. Oh, thank you kindly. Well, oh. Speaking of, of, a, of a kindly 
Greetings. Yeah, you I'm, look tired. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Yeah. Say good night, Justin. I can't. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We do hope to see you again next week. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe, all that stuff. Help us grow our audience. And uh, yeah, let's have more kindly admonishments. <laughs> everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious. See you next week.